What is going on today, Miami Dolphins fans? How is everybody doing? It is Ben Morgan of the Fins Up Network. Today we are wrapping up our roster comparison videos for our Miami Dolphins. If you missed the first one, definitely go back and check that one out. We did the offensive side of the ball just a couple of days ago. And like I said, I will be back with the defense. So that is what we were doing today. So what I really wanted to do in case you missed that first video, basically compare this roster position by position offensively. And like I said today, defensively, did we get better in certain positional groups? Did we get worse? Did we stay the same? I want to see really how this team stacks up compared to that 2023 roster as we get set for training camp, which is coming up later in July. So I will share my screen with you guys in a second, put the positional groupings up. But just like we did for the offensive side of the ball, which gear do you think has the advantage for these positional groupings? If you think it's 2023, if you think it's 2024, for whichever of the positional groups, go ahead and drop your thoughts in the comments real quick. Like I said, go back and check out that one from the offensive side of the ball as well. It was dropped like a couple of days ago. From that though, I said that 2024 had the positional advantage for every single position outside of offensive line. And that sounds kind of all good because it's like, okay, well, we're better at quarterback, running back, receiver, tight end. But does offensive line carry that much weight, so much weight that, you know what, we weren't as good in 2024, at least on paper, as what we were in 2023. And it's not like we were juggernauts in 2023. So how much weight does the actual position that we're talking about factor into this as well? But like I said, we're going to get jumping into the defense. I will share my screen just like we did for the offensive version. So we are going to get things kicked off right away with the defensive line. Now, it's funny because if I'd have done this video like a week, week and a half, two weeks ago, whenever it was, this would have been a slam dunk advantage 2023 for me. Well, as you can see, obviously, on the screen there, it is still advantage 2023. But with that signing of Calais Campbell, you know what? Like I said, it's still advantage 2023 for me, but that gap is not near as big as it was prior to that signing. And now if you if you just compare those players and the players talking about Christian Wilkins versus a what a 38 year old uh, Calais Campbell, yeah, I'm still going to give that advantage to to Christian Wilkins in this situation, a guy that just signed what one of the biggest defensive contracts we've ever seen entering the prime of his career. Yeah, it's going to be hard to top that. But quite honestly, at the like vet minimum price that you get Calais Campbell at, that yeah, I know he's 38, but man, you talk about a guy that's just, there's every once in a while, there's those guys out there that just defy age, they defy logic, and Calais Campbell has been one of those guys. He's still continuing to play hundreds of snaps every single season. I think he logged like over 600, 700 snaps last year with the Falcons. And it's not that his statistical production is dropping off all that much either. He's still a menace in the run game. He still has the moves and the, the vet sav veteran savviness to get to the quarterback. I think he had, what, like six or seven sacks last year as well. Sorry if my numbers are wrong on that. It's been a while since I studied up on, on Campbell on this one. But what he also does is making those people around him so much better. We were wondering, how is Zach Sealer going to do without Pepper next to him, without Christian Wilkins next to him? Well, guess what? We've got a guy that's been doing it for so many years now that I don't worry really about any sort of production statistical drop off from a guy like Zach Sealer. And then what Campbell does for your linebackers as well. This addition has the potential of being one of the more underrated signings and for how late it happened in free agency and for the price they got him at. Like I said, I'm still going advantage 2023. It doesn't move the needle that much for me. It's not Christian Wilkins level. But man, you talk about the one guy that we could bring in that I feel really damn comfortable with. It's 100% Calais Campbell. Now, I do think that you got Sealer, you got Campbell. You're going to need a third, maybe probably a fourth option to emerge from training camp as well. Because keep in mind, as you can see, we don't have a guy like Raekwon Davis anymore. But you got a guy like Deshaun Hand who was here last year. You got Tierra Tart who hasn't really lived up to his potential, but man, all the physical tools is there. You bring him, you bring back a guy like Benito Jones as well. That's a familiar face with the organization. So yeah, like I said, a couple of weeks ago you asked me, it is slam dunk 2023. The gap is close. I'm still going 2023 for this one. Like I said, though, drop your thoughts 
in the comments. Let's move on to the position of edge rusher for this one. Now, I definitely want to hear from you because I don't know if pushback is the right word, but I would welcome some feedback, some pushback, um, specifically at this position if you disagree with where I am, because I'm going to go advantage 2023. Now, I say that knowing that I love the addition of Shaq Barrett, knowing what we have with, with Phillips and, and Chubb and needing a third pass rusher and needing a guy to get more snaps while they get back. Shaq Barrett was a great fill-in, a guy that can fill in for that Andrew Van Ginkle. Absolutely, Chubb Robinson, one of my favorite edge rushers in this position, and then or in this last draft, and then Mo Kamara, one of my favorite mid-round edge rushers in this draft. So that trio of Shaq Barrett, Chop Robinson, Mo Kamara, I actually prefer that to Andrew Van Ginkle and Emmanuel Ogba. If you look, that's that's kind of what it is. However, I'm going to go advantage 2023 once again simply due to the health of the top two. And I know that's maybe it's a little bit cheating because you know what you could say, hey, we got the same top two in 23 as we did in 2024. But with how things stand today, I want the healthy top two edge rushers versus the guys that are, you know what, highly unlikely to be good to go by week one, even if they come back at some point during the season. Are they going to be 100%? Are they going to be 100% at all this entire season? So that's the case that I'm going to make here. I'm going to go with the healthy one and two option versus the option that in 2024 where it's, yeah, maybe they could get healthy at some point in time. And then I like the guys afterwards. Give me the healthy Chubb. Give me the healthy Phillips. Because, man, do you remember last year when they started really clicking and, and feeding off of each other and this defense was just thriving? They, they were both, you could have argued, they were both on their way to having Pro Bowl-like seasons. So, yeah, this one hurts me a little bit because, like I said, Shaq Barrett, Chop Robinson, Mo Kamara, if a guy like Grayson Murphy can make this roster as well, if we get those other guys back healthy, this went from a position where you go into free agency before you sign Shaq Barrett. This is probably a position of weakness, not knowing the health of the top two guys. Well, man, if they get even anywhere near healthy, it's probably considered a position of strength. You got Chop Robinson, who I think is able to have produced meaningful snaps already in year one, and now he's probably going to have to. But man, you'd have the luxury of him with Shaq Barrett not having to be starter quality as uh, starter quality reps as well when you got Phillips and Chubb. Like I said, I could go. I love the position of edge rusher. I love the guys we have. It's almost a shame that we're going to have to play this year without a probably 100% Jalen Phillips and 100% Bradley Chubb. So for that reason. I'm going to go 2023 for the advantage. All right, let's move on to the linebackers where, yes, I finally have a 2024 advantage on the defensive side of the ball. And this one, in my opinion, this likely boils down to what's your preference between Jerome Baker and, and Jordan Brooks. Now, I'm personally a, a, Jordan, a bigger Jordan Brooks fan than I was a Jerome Baker fan. And I always liked Jerome Baker. Jerome Baker was one of the more underrated contributors for this team. I know we battled a couple of different injuries last year, but always a guy you could rely on health-wise. Kind of the quarterback of the defense, getting the play calls, making sure everyone's lined up. Really just kind of, I don't want to say average at everything because he was pretty good at a lot of things, but you just you know, seem to always want more from what he was able to provide on the field. Now, I don't know that Jordan Brooks has necessarily lived up to his draft capital a, a few years back, but I do, like I said, I do like what he brings to the table, though. He is a tackling machine. It's not that coverage is an outright strength of his. It's not a liability either. You can trust him in some of those situations, especially some of that zone coverage. But I also like his ability as a blitzer a little bit more than Jerome Baker. So with all due respect to Jerome Baker for however long he was here with the Miami Dolphins, always ready to play. I'm going to give the advantage here to Jordan Brooks. And now another thing about this linebacker position is when you make a signing of a guy like Anthony Walker, I didn't I originally think, you know, a depth guy, a special teams kind of guy. And now I don't want to put too much pressure on him by saying this as well, but I've been told that's a guy to keep an eye on. And maybe he's not challenging for David Long or Jordan Brooks type of snaps in regards to quantity. But at the end of the day, if that's still a guy that we can rely on where we maybe don't have to fall back to the Duke Riley plan like we had to last year, and it kind of showed how much we needed Jerome Baker when Duke Riley was coming in and missing tackles, out of position, a liability and coverage. It really showed what Jerome Baker meant to this defense. But maybe a guy like Anthony Walker can be that, that next guy up 
type of deal. If something were to happen to Long or Brooks or one of those guys needs a little bit of a breather uh, in a different package, whatever it ends up being. And I know there's more guys on there as well. But at the end of the day, I think this position comes down to, do you believe in David Long or do you believe in Jordan Brooks? Like I said, whoever you probably trust more between those two is likely going to get your call. I'm going to go with Brooks. I'm going to go with the linebackers for 2024. Let's move on to the cornerbacks. This one actually kind of comes as a little bit of a surprise to me as well. As you can see, I'm going 2024. But if you'd have told me when we ended up making the pairing of Xavier Howard and Jalen Ramsey, I was going to say, you know what? That's it. That's our Madison. That's this generation's version of Madison and Sertan. At some point in time, when one of those guys leaves, likely going to be Xavier Howard. It was Xavier Howard. We're going to have a tough time bouncing back from something like that. We're not going to have that duel. Well, with what we've seen, though, Xavier Howard, the last couple of years, battling, battling some injuries two years ago, was kind of asked to do a little bit, probably too much, given all the, the injuries that we had in the secondary. And then last year, battling some injuries, you probably saw him lose, like, what, a, a step, a, a half step. Just wasn't quite the lockdown cornerback that we got so accustomed to see, seeing year in and year out as Miami Dolphins fans. So, like I said, you go back in time, I'd say, you know what? As soon as we lose Xavier and Howard, we're not, we're not going to be as good at the position for a while. I say that, like I said, as a little bit of a surprise, though, because not that I think Kendall Fuller was probably ever at his max what Xavier and Howard was. I think he's got more in the tank right now, though, and what he's going to be asked to do if he can play that other boundaries um, position, which I'm, I'm sure he's going to end up doing. So I actually think you're probably a little bit better off right now at Kendall Fuller and what he's going to end up making this year compared to what Xavier Howard was making and what, what he was allegedly asking for as well. I don't mind that addition of Kendall Fuller. And what you can also think about here is we're in year two of Cam Smith, another guy who's obviously on the 23 list and the 24 list. I don't think he's going to regress. I don't think he can be any worse than what he was in 2023 because it's not even a matter if he was good or bad. He just wasn't on the field. So any sort of contribution from Cam Smith is going to make him an upgrade as well. But this is where it gets beautiful because if you stay healthy and you've got Ramsey and you've got Fuller and you've got, um, if you've got Cam Smith, well, allowing all of those guys that can be able to play that boundary, that keeps Cater Kohu in that slot where we've seen time and time again, that's where he's better. Last year, what? He was thrust into playing some of that boundary role and guess what? It didn't go all that well. So if you can keep him to that one slot, position on defense in the secondary, that's going to make him better as well in 2024. Now take this to another level. If those guys stay healthy, if all those guys can play boundary, you just unleashed one of the NFL, one of the defensive players in the NFL to his full capacity, to his full potential. And that's what new defensive coordinator, Anthony, um, Anthony Weaver wants as well. He wants to use Jalen Ramsey as that chess piece, whether he's playing on the boundary, whether you move him back into a safety role, wherever you want to put him, because Jalen Ramsey is that unique defensive player, football IQ off the charts, the ability that he has to be able to read quarterbacks, read plays pre and post snap off the charts as well. And now you're going to let him go out there and kind of freelance where you got these other guys that you can count on. That's 100% what we wanted Vic Fangio to do, but he didn't do. Anthony Weaver appears to be a lot more flexible and wanting to do that. So being able to unleash different schem schematics on defense, different schemes, maybe doing something different on a week to week, week basis matched, uh, based on your matchups as well. I just think that we can unleash so much more potential, but it all starts with the health as well. Let's wrap things up with the safeties on this one. So now this is kind of another one of those positional groups where in my opinion, if you're choosing between 2023 and 2024, it comes down to 2023. Did you like Deshaun Elliott and Brandon Jones? Or in 2024, are you going to be a bigger fan of Jordan Poyer and Marcus May? Now, as you can see, I went advantage 2024. So I quite honestly think I didn't mind Deshaun Elliott. I actually, I like Brandon Jones. He just wasn't necessarily a scheme fit under Vic Fangio. Then he suffered some injuries as well. Jordan Poyer, despite, what was he, 32, I believe he's at right now, or he's going to be. That's a guy who, we talk about Andrew Van Ginkel, who used to have a nose for the ball. Jordan Poyer was that for the Bills. Whether it was forcing fumbles, recovering fumbles, being in the right spot for the interceptions, um, sneaking up into the, into the line of scrimmage and getting those tackles right after the line of scrimmage, 
That's what Jordan Poyer was. And if he can be that in this offense, while well, Javon Holland can kind of be freed up to do his thing as well. I think Poyer is an upgrade to a guy like Deshaun Elliott. Now, if you look at a guy like Marcus May, and if you were to compare him against Brandon Jones, per se, like I said, I like Brandon Jones. Denver paid so much. We got Marcus May one for what? Again, the, the veteran, veteran men. So yeah, Brandon Jones maybe is a better safety, but what for what we're asking that safety to do, who Marcus May, who's been an starter his entire NFL career, he's probably not going to have to be a starter on this team. He can be a rotational guy. He can be a third safety kind of guy. He's got he's got so much more freedom to just be whatever we whatever we need him to be. We're not going to rely on him the way we would if we'd have forked over the type of coin like a guy like Brandon Jones got as well. So quite honestly, I am a big fan of the secondary right now. And now prior to the Marcus May signing, I was like, oh, if something happens to Holland, you know, something happens to Poyer, depth is going to be tested. You can see the names on there right now. You're likely looking at a guy like Elijah Campbell that has the only NFL experience, McMorris being a rookie, the other two being undrafted free agents. We definitely needed to bring someone. I know a lot of us wanted Justin Simmons. At the end of the day, we kind of went to the discount bin, but a guy like Marcus May, being around as long as he has been around in the starter role that he has been as well, being able to play up into the box, not being an absolute liability in coverage as well. I just like this complete grouping of safeties more than I liked with Holland, Elliott, and Jones. And that's no slight to those guys because, like I said, I think all of those guys really have a role in a, in a, in a use in the NFL as well. Um, I'm going to call right there in regards to the um, – actual positional breakdown. But like I said, that leaves us an offense where I had one position in 2023 being the offensive line versus the uh, the defense. What I have 2023, I ended up having defensive line. I ended up having the edge. And then I ended up going 2024 for linebackers, cornerbacks, and safeties. But like I sort of alluded to in the intro, it's like, yeah, we're, we're on paper better at those positions than we were in 2023. But the importance of those positions has to factor in because when we go back to offense, it was the trenches. It was the offensive line. We know that's where games are won and lost. You flip the flip the, 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 the script on that one. Defensively, in the trenches once again with the defensive line and edge. And I know, like I said, edge can go either way on this one, but the defensive line as well. So, yeah, I would be willing to say that as of what, – what's the date? Today is uh, June 24th. I feel better saying that we, I feel good saying that we are a better team in 2024 than we are in 2023. But a lot of this is going to boil down to, can we sort of mask a few of those losses that we had at those super important positions? Because Robert Hunt is going to be hard to replace. We'll see if we can replace Connor Williams. Christian Wilkins, Raekwon Davis, can we replace those guys with a 38-year-old Clayus Campbell? We will see. The safeties as well, which we just covered. But like I said, it's a it's a tight race, but I will give the advantage as of whatever the hell date I just said it was to the Miami Dolphins in 2024. But like I said, I got to hear from you as well. So drop your thoughts on the positional groups. Who's got your advantage between the two years of those overall? Do you see this team being better, equal or worse than 2023? Drop it all in the comments. I will call it right there for today, Miami Dolphins fans. Thanks to everyone who checked in. If you haven't gotten subscribed yet, make sure you are doing so. But like I said, we will kill it right there for today, Miami Dolphins fans. And until next time, fins up.